Our final work day of the year, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Billy. Good morning, Rob. First day of winter, but no snow. It's going to be a non-white winter. Let's, uh, let's keep it that way, at least until I get home. Also, uh, <laughs> the Sarge, the Badger, uh, Michael Hyde. Good morning, Delegate. Or Bunny Rabbit. Good morning. <laughs> or Bunny Rabbit. Good, good morning. You never lived that down, man. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> The, the badger bunny rabbit. Yeah, I think he likes badger better than he does bunny rabbit. <laughs> but and for that reason alone, we'll call him bunny rabbit. <laughs> when you find a weakness, exploit the weakness. All right? Our uh, year ends uh, in terms of the work year. We're, we're the boss is shutting us down all next week. So this is the final show of 2023, and we are back on Tuesday, January 2, day after New Year's. To begin a whole new year. Shortly after that, uh, this guy takes off uh, for Charleston, as well as 99 other delegates, 34 senators, and such to begin another legislative session. Uh, Michael Heights will have to find a replacement for you again. Yeah. Um, easily replaced, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, <yeah. laughs> hey, it took two, three people last time. Let me let me add, uh, add to that, Rob. Uh, I think we're in the Eastern Panhandle are very blessed or privileged of having delegates and senators that take such a take the job so serious and work so hard. I see Mike. Uh, uh, the year round, he's always involved trying to learn more about the community and trying to help the community. I see this from the other delegates as well and the senators. So, again, I think we're very fortunate to have the representatives that we have from the Eastern Panhandle. Well said. Well, I, I appreciate that, Bill. And, and you know, I'll, I'll be honest, when I first got into this, I had no idea uh, the time commitment that the delegates and, and senators really put into this. This is... Um, this is much more of a, a full-time thing than, than what people uh, realize when they get into it. And I, I would add, I would extend that, Mike. I think that applies to all elected jobs. If you do the job right, county commissioner, I used to say it was more than a 40-hour week job, even though you've only been paid for one day. Sure. Uh, uh, but it's, it is it is a to do the job right requires a lot of your time. And yes. it's your personal time. You're not being... Uh, financially reimbursed for it. Correct. Our guest in this first segment is political commentator Ron Gregory. He's joined us a few different times uh, over this past year, and uh, we've added him to uh, our family here on the program. Ron, good morning to you. Merry Christmas. Good morning. Happy, happy holiday. Uh, I do think, by the way, that one of the uh, major things that have happened in politics and state in the last year maybe is underscored by the uh, resignation of uh, Delegate Capito, mm -hmm. Moore Capito, the governor candidate, who has resigned his, uh, well, it's effective today, I believe, uh, resigned his House of Delegates seat from Kanawha County uh, to devote full time to uh, the governor campaign. And he pointed out that as, certainly as chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and I'm sure the delegate would agree with this, uh, as chairman of that committee, he didn't, doesn't have time to run for governor. So uh, I think that that, that kind of adds to the commentary we just discussed on that subject. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Ron. And, and certainly, I think as we close down the year, that would have to uh, wind up as one of the top stories of the year, too, the resignation of the judiciary chairman. You don't see that happen too often. No. And uh, at least not under good terms. And, and these, uh, there's certainly nothing chasing more capital out that would be detrimental to his character or name. This is simply a matter of wanting to concentrate on running for governor. We've invited Ron on to talk about some of the biggest stories of 2023 as this year winds to a close. And we asked him to put together a list of some of the more memorable stories, some of the more moving stories, and uh, uh, certainly politically uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, relevant stories of this past year. So, Ron, uh, what's uh, what's on your list here this morning? Well, definitely Jefferson and County and the Eastern Panhandle are involved in several important stories. Of course, the one that's still going on is the uh, battle on the County Commission. Uh, looks like it's now 3-2 um, with the addition of... Uh, the new commissioner mm -hmm. uh, swung to three two. Uh, the other, well, I guess I'd say the other way, um, more more liberal, perhaps. At least that's what many conservatives tell me. Uh, I guess we'll get to see. Although they've already uh, 
enacted the uh, solar tax or reenacted it, that that uh, bill, I guess, mm-hmm. or a piece of legislation or ordinance or whatever they may call it. I'm not not familiar enough with their operation to know. Is it an ordinance? Is that what they passed? I, I believe so, yes. Huh? Bill, I'll okay. let you be the judge of that as a former yeah. commission member. Ron, how did that story play around the states? I think that it played the way that um, the, the the president of the commission, Stolfer, and uh, and Tab would want it to. I think it it played that Jackson and uh, Kraus were just uh, neglecting their job, or not showing up to work because they were unhappy. I mean, I don't agree with that. I've even, you know, kind of in my column. Uh, those who have seen it uh, in recent weeks and months know that I've, I'm pretty much on Jackson Krause's side on several of these issues. But I think that, uh, uh, for example, my uh, proofreader uh, is uh, a, a retired English teacher, very intelligent lady that I actually grew up with, and um uh, I asked her immediately, she proofreads my column, and the first first one that I did talking about the uh, this situation in Jefferson County Commission, uh, I asked her what she thought after just reading what I said about it, and she said, those two commissioners need to get get on and do their job, or, or they need to elect somebody else. And I kind of think that's how it played, and I understand the point that the Teresa Jackson and, and uh, uh, Jennifer Krause were making, and I understand why they felt they couldn't go, but I'm not sure from the public relations side, certainly around the state, I don't think it played out the way they would have wanted it to. I think, again, all it, all it said to most casual readers or viewers or listeners was that your Sioux County commissioners not getting their way, so they won't go to work. And, and again, you know, I pointed out in the column, and I mentioned it today as well, uh, as elected officials know, and we've got some here who know that, uh, the county commission job is certainly not uh, all-encompassing in those monthly, weekly, or bi-weekly meetings that they have. And I'm sure that Jackson and Krause were doing their jobs, but they were not attending those meetings to keep a quorum from existing. And and I'm not sure that message ever got out very clearly. Ron, I want to let uh, Bill, who's a former commission member himself here in Berkeley County, was the president of the commission, comment on your thoughts there, Bill. Well, Ron, I'm less sympathetic as what you are. Uh, I feel if you're an elected official, you have an obligation to the folks that voted you in. You have an obligation to the office which you're holding. Part of that obligation is to, to do the job as you're supposed to do. And if you boycott, if you stay away from the job, they function just, in this case, Jefferson County, they, the county commission could not function at all. It just ceased to function. Uh, there's a lot of business that needed to be done, much of which we do not realize on the uh, outside, but passing bonds, uh, uh, passing uh, pay, uh, paying, the, the whole series of things. That was not being done. Uh, there's a place and time to make a make your stand, uh, a stand on principle. Uh, boycotting your job is not that place to make your stand on principle. So I, I again, I applaud you for your uh, uh, your position, but I'm a lot less sympathetic. Well, yeah. I, and I certainly understand yours. And as I say, I think with the average uh, voter, with um, even even a very casual uh, political observer would get the same impression. And uh, I can see the point, and I can see uh, how that conclusion would be drawn. Uh, again, I, I look at the other side and say, well, um, they were at least stopping uh, what they maintain, that Jackson, that's Jackson and Krause maintain, uh, was the potential appointment of uh, somebody who was not qualified for the job, but but they still ended up not accomplishing anything uh, 
because they ended they ended up getting not getting the person they said that about to begin with, but they still ended up with someone who's not aligned with them politically and philosophically. So uh, I see your point. I totally understand it, and, and I think uh, you know there's something to be said for both both sides, maybe. Yeah, if I could, you used the term a while ago, kind of alluded to liberal. I would not consider Jefferson County Commission to be liberal in any sense of the word. Uh, it's conservative. It depends upon what scale of the conservative spectrum you want to look at. Extremely, extremely conservative or more moderate conservative. But I would not view them as liberal at all. Mike, I, yeah, I would I would agree with that as well, Bill. That I, I think I think what uh, what they were trying to say that is the it became more liberal than it was it was it was yeah. far right with with Krauss and Jackson and by appointing the Republican uh, Pasha Majdi who is much more moderate that the 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 council or the commission as a whole became it shifted more to the center than it had been um, and I'm going to agree with with Bill on this I believe you're elected to a position you have to show up and if if things had not played out the way they had I believe you would have set a precedent for a minority party um, type situation where the minority party if there had been let's say two Democrats instead of of all Republicans but two Democrats could have you know done the same thing if they weren't getting their way in in a body of five like this and so I, I think the right thing happened I'm glad it was all one party so that it didn't seem partisan but I can see if the wrong precedent had been set where this could have been a very partisan issue uh, in years to come, so I'm glad it played out the way it did. Let's. Uh, let, I want to move. Can on I make here. one point? Uh, uh, government works best by compromise, and that's what happens. We need to compromise. Ron, what else is on your list for 2023? Well, um, I guess uh, another thing that uh, we've talked about heavily in our our publication or our website, or I'm never sure exactly how what what you refer to these. Uh, uh, internet newspapers as <laughs> I guess it's not newspaper because there are no paper involved right uh, but but one of them in of the major things we've talked about for the last nearly year are the ties of uh, the attorney general uh, Patrick Morrissey and particularly his wife with regard to China Russia Planned Parenthood and so forth um, that is a major concern, I think, and I think it's much of a more of a concern than perhaps the Attorney General and his uh, campaign people expected it to be. Um, you know, they can, it, it's kind of like anything we discuss, some opponents can figure a reason why they're opposed to something, and people who are for something can figure out a reason why they're for it. Uh, but I think that a lot of uh, many, many potential voters were not as aware of the ties of Mrs. Morrissey, Denise Morrissey's uh, public relations work with China, Russia, and particularly Pan Planned Parenthood. We've got many, many comments about that. And uh, that doesn't fit exactly, uh, as we all know here, the image of a Republican governor. And back to just for a second, that county commission, uh, I, you, you summed up better than I did exactly what I think about it. I, I didn't mean to say that they were a, a, a socialist liberal uh, headquarters now. I just they, they do do, I think, move more in the other direction. But but certainly not the majority of, of their decisions will be liberal by any means. I understood that. And I didn't make that very clear. Yeah, I, I don't think any of their decisions will be under the classically liberal label for what they do. I, yeah. I remember Pasha Majdi when he was running for the House of Delegates, the seat that eventually Bill Ridenauer won, and Pasha sounded like he was running for uh, the far right wing of the Republican congressional <laughs> election uh, uh, vote. Uh, I, I thought I regarded Pasha as very conservative. So if he's if he's left I of think. Trisha Jackson and, and Jennifer Krause, I, then I don't know how far right they really are. Then, he's he's and pretty they conservative are, too. They are very far right. And yes. uh, and the interesting thing about Pasha is that um, I, I say it's interesting. Uh, it is to a reporter. I think I tried talking to him uh, several times when he was running for the House, 
and uh, frankly never got much of an answer from him about anything, uh, including uh, his commitment as far as, uh, you know, living in Jefferson County, West Virginia, when he had just run for mayor of Vienna, Virginia. Uh, and, but uh, I'm, I asked him uh, if, you know, the move or I guess he didn't actually move physically, but the um, if he's now being a, a candidate and a, a now a public official in in West Virginia, if he was really rooted here. And I never again, I never got really got an answer even to that question. That's not surprising to me. I I, I believe that's he's why I said prob- I thought he's running for Congress. Yeah, he's he seems to be one of the more polished politicians in this area, and has has come here to to make his mark. It, because if you look at his history, he has run for political office in other areas, um, and then comes here, and he even has I would say more of a uh, left wing type background when you look into you know, what he does for a living and stuff like that. I was sort of surprised the move here to West Virginia and um, his his rhetoric once he got here. Well, I just thought, I, I'm sorry, I just thought that if uh, Commissioner Jackson and Krause must have been able to get clearer answers from him than I was ever able to, to have any idea what he might do as a county commissioner. They seem to know, but, but I, I certainly wouldn't have been able to ferret that out from from our conversations, sure. Um, I think too, you've got the uh, an issue that again we raised at our uh, website, and that is the uh, issue of, of questioning about uh, Pres- Senate President C- uh, Craig Blair's travel time and uh, reimbursement for time, uh, and I think that's that's pretty got a lot of attention down this way. It did. Now, there was an ethics. Uh, Senator Carnes had requested an ethics investigation of Senator Blair. Yes. From what I understand, that investigation came back and cleared him. Do you, did you get that information as well? Yeah, I've heard that. I, I assume it to be true. It's, they're, they're pretty tight-lipped at the Ethics Commission, which they should be. Uh, but I, I believe that is the case. I think uh, I think we would have heard more about it by now if, if it had been a, a major problem. So apparently it was not. Mm-hmm. I do think, of course, and as I know you, y'all know a lot better than I do, uh, President Blair, Senator Blair is in quite a battle for re-election. So I don't think he needs that cropping up uh, as the election moves along. So that's, that's another one of the, the – uh, I think the biggest news event, of course, was Joe Manchin leaving the Senate. I can't imagine anything would top that story in the next four or five days, although I will mention to the to the uh, uh, state government, at least, seems to be shut down for the next week, too. Uh, I guess you've seen that. We, uh, we discuss all the time, my having been around government and the legislature and so forth for 50 some years um there was a time when if a governor declared uh that he was going to give you two hours off on thanksgiving eve everybody in the media would scream and (laughs) and go to the uh budget people at the state and find out what it was costing to operate state government uh and then giving the employees time off and it just seems this governor just gives them days, weeks. Uh, they're all, they're all. Uh, <laughs> well, of course they would be anyway. But Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, mm-hmm. four days. That's incredible. He just, yeah, he issued the two hours, uh, and I think that it got extended to the entire day Friday here. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, in regards to the governor, so you've got the governor's bid for the Senate now, Ron. Is there any skepticism about the governor's chances of winning that race or around the state? Is it regarded as a slam dunk? Oh, I think it's absolutely regarded as a slam dunk. In fact, I had some conversations yesterday with uh, some political consultants who said that the, that there is absolutely no way uh, that they, they, they said if they came and padlocked the door of the Greenbrier and led the governor away in shackles, 
he'd still be elected <laughs> to the United States Senate. Now, that's, that's, I mean, I don't want anybody out there listening to think there's any chance of, that I think there's any chance of any of that happening. But uh, that, that was certainly summarizing how seriously he thought. Uh, he said that uh, Congressman Mooney just absolutely, there's, there's no road uh, to the United States Senate for Congressman Mooney. And I, I think that's right. I think it's just an absolute slam dunk. And I do think that Moore Capito is, is making the right decision by deciding to uh, you know, give up his House seat and run uh, for governor. Uh, because I think that race is his, and I know this may not be the popular thing to say in the Eastern Panhandle where uh, Morrissey is, but I think that Capito is the one who uh, certainly can win that race. And I would, I would actually say, based on what I know at this point, uh, that Capito would be in the lead right now. And uh, you know, one of the one of the other things we discussed when I was talking with some of these. Uh, well-known state political consultants was uh, that they, they one of them said they had given Steve Williams, the mayor of Huntington and Democrat, the one and only Democrat that we know of, a candidate for governor in 2024, they had given him the advice to just uh, put it, make his campaign slogan, vote Steve Williams for governor, have you met my opponents, if he happens to be Morrissey. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're meaning behind that is they think that uh, Morrissey, the more he sees people, the less votes he gets. Now, I've always had a, a very cordial relationship with him, but uh, I do do get from a lot of people that he's, they think he's kind of standoffish. And it surprises me that uh, from everybody I hear from that, that uh, Mooney makes a better impression than Morrissey does in person. Yeah. Ron, going back to the Justice Mooney race, uh, Club for Growth uh, had pledged uh, $10 million for for Mooney. They've invested, I think, $1.2 million for some initial ads. With mm-hmm. your impression that it's a slam dunk for justice, are you seeing any suggestion at all that Club for Growth is going to redirect some of this $10 million? Yes. Yes, I, I was told yesterday by a very high-ranking uh, uh, person who has great inside track with them that you had probably seen about the last of the of the funding they were going to provide, that uh, they are very seriously considering pulling it out. Of course, the one other thing that uh, gets discussed among those of us who talk about politics, and that is what what if Mooney would decide, well, it's a hopeless cause, as well, and decided to run for Congress uh, for his uh, his current seat. Uh, now, those people that I talked to said that they didn't believe he could beat uh, uh, probably more now that we've gotten this far along, but uh, that would certainly make it interesting if he decided to do that. Well, I, they've endorsed each other, from what I understand. It would be interesting if Alex changed his mind and decided to run against Riley. That would create a lot of friction there. I would. Yeah. Oh, there'd be all kind of friction. Yeah, they, they'd make the. Well, I, I don't know whether they could make the Jefferson County Commission look tame or not. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it, it would just be. It would just be a different battle. That's all. Hey, Alex. Uh-huh. Alex Mooney is schooled at this. He is. Uh, I, I. I know that uh, one thing is for sure. If Alex loses, it won't be because you don't know everything about Jim Justice that's available. No, I no, absolutely. Yeah. And there's no question about that. I think another uh, thing that's just occurred here in the last week or 10 days uh, that that I puzzle over and, and wonder about how it could possibly do the candidate any good, but that is Mac Warner insisting and insisting and insisting and putting out uh, op-eds and uh, wading into and wanting everybody to understand that he thinks the CIA, the FBI, who knows, ABC, NBC, CBS, uh, you know, Jefferson County, we were all involved in the conspiracy to steal the last election. Now, do I believe the last election might have been stolen? Do I think that there is... uh, 
enough evidence that I would I wonder if it wasn't stolen. Absolutely. I'm a Trump supporter. It's hard for me to believe that some of the things that you see in in the boat returns and the the uh, you know when when boats showed up and when they didn't show up and when you uh, Biden jumped by ten points and all that kind of thing. There's enough there that I think it's possible, but I can't imagine if the Trump voters in the state of West Virginia need to be reminded over and over and over that uh, the, Mac Warner thinks the election was stolen by their you know their own CIA, their own FBI. Uh, if if I just don't know how a political person weighed the positives against the negatives there and came up with hey, yeah, this is time to go on a statewide tour to talk about the stolen election by the FBI and the CIA. Do you think it's resonating with the voters, Ron? No, it doesn't. It does not seem to be. Uh, the ones that I know, uh, you know, that are uh, Warner. You, I mean, if if they were a Warner supporter. And, and a Trumpite, they are still uh, a Warner supporter. If they weren't, they're not listening to that. They just, they just say, well, uh, he's just trying to pander. He's trying to get uh, uh, Donald Trump's endorsement. And I have been told very, again, I think very reliably that that, that isn't going to happen anyway. So, again, I, I just don't know how you weigh the good and the bad and, and figure that's a, a smart move. We always thought in all of when I was doing political consulting, uh, that if, well, the one expression we had is there's no use going into a battle when you know you can't win the war. Yeah. And hey. so why why bring that subject up on, a, on the campaign trail if it doesn't, if, if there's no chance of it getting any positive spin? And again, I'd have to, somebody have to explain to me how you get positive spin out of that. Ron, uh, you said something earlier that caught me totally off guard, and I'm looking at our Facebook chat, and it also caught several other people off guard as well, and that was the involvement of Pat Morris's wife with Planned, Par- Planned Parenthood, Russia, China, and the like. This is, this is news to me. Uh, so uh, would you expand on that a little bit? Well, uh, Denise Morrissey, uh, of course, lives uh, in Greenbrier County now, and that has nothing to do with the question you just asked me, but I just want to lay the land a little. She's in Greenbrier County, and uh, so I'm not sure how actively involved she is uh, at this point in time in uh, her the, the company that she formed in, DC, in Washington, D.C. Uh, she certainly still gets a percentage, we do know that, of, uh, according to their reports that they have to file, uh, she gets a, a percentage of, of the consulting that they do, that that firm does, for various and sundry corporations, uh, and, and it gets down to as far as to uh, national concerns uh, in other countries and that sort of thing. And the thing that, uh, and we did a pretty extensive uh, set of articles about it, but the thing that uh, spurred, uh, obviously, our most interest uh, and was known at least by a couple of the other candidates uh, running against Patrick, that uh, that firm has represented companies that are tied directly to the Communist Chinese Party, uh, that are directly tied to uh, President Putin and uh, the Russian uh, party that he leads, uh, and that, I mean, according to their own reports, that they have done work for Planned Parenthood. Now, before uh, Patrick, uh, before well, I would say before he moved to West Virginia, but before any of us knew he had moved to West Virginia, uh, he was involved with that firm as well and um, I think that it can be documented that the Chinese Communist Party and uh, the Russian rulers and Planned Parenthood have used that uh, uh, organization that Denise Morsi formed and um, 
One of the things that uh, when I said what I did about uh, the, the Steve Williams motto of have you met my opponent, uh, I don't know how much contact or if, if any at all uh, you all, any of y'all would have with the people in Greenbrier County. But if you call called up the county chair in Greenbrier, if you called up the Republican executive committee members in uh, Greenbrier County, their only comment about uh, Patrick Morrissey and Denise Morrissey is that they've caused confusion, uproars, uh, division, and all kinds of things within the uh, Republican Executive Committee in Greenbrier. Now, you know, we'll go back and say to, that there's no question that Republican Executive Committees, Democrats for that matter, can too. Uh, they can cause enough confusion on their own, but uh, if uh, if you take into consideration the companies that, uh, or, and, and countries and organizations that that firm has represented, and then you take into consideration the disruption she has caused in Greenbar County, uh, I think it, conservatives might have a real problem voting for him if they, if they knew all those facts. And we've tried, well, we certainly tried to put them out there, and I'd... Uh, Again, I'd refer you, or you can, if you want to send me your uh, email address, I'll send to you the documentation. I mean, we, we quoted uh, where we got every piece of information we got, and what we did receive uh, about an hour later was a call and then an uh, email from the Morrissey campaign uh, asking us to cease and desist, but we haven't ceased and desisted because it's the truth. And uh, so we've heard nothing since then. Ron, on that note, we'll have to end our segment. I appreciate your time this morning, as always, and uh, look forward to talking to you again in 2024. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, sir. Well, we, we can do the what the greatest thing happening of the week, if you want. No, yeah, that, that'd be marvelous, <laughs> especially with the session uh, coming up here. Have yeah, a great, we'll be glad to. Have a great holiday season, Ron. Y'all have a great holiday, too, and uh, I look forward to getting up there and seeing. I want to see the Jefferson County Commission in action. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you can. <laughs> Last month you couldn't. Merry Christmas, Thank you, Ron. Merry Christmas Ron.